one of the worst feelings in the world is having a bad serving day. So I know you've felt that before, a terrible serving day, you get all nervous, you feel real choky. Well, imagine doing that in front of the entire world. So don't feel bad because Alexander Zarev, unfortunately, has been doing this all throughout the US Open, somehow magically got to the finals. And today we have with us Jeff Salzenstein. He is the serve doctor. He is great, former top 100 ATP pro. He's gonna be part of our Tennis Con 4 event. He's gonna do an awesome video on the big kick, kicking a big serve. And um, so we're here to talk about what happened to Alexander Zarev, what might be happening to you, and how you can fix it from a technical aspect and a mental aspect. We're super excited about this. We already got a lot of people on the stream, and I'm gonna bring Jeff in. So Jeff, how are you doing today? Fantastic, it's a beautiful, Friday morning here in Denver, Colorado, and it is a pleasure to be on with you today, Peter. Yeah, I noticed that we had a lot of interest in this topic today, and I think it's because, you know, first of all, it's tough to watch when you're seeing that happen, and, and everybody kind of feels what he's feeling. We've all kind of felt nervous like that, right? Yeah, it's, it's amazing, you know, to watch this changing of the guard and you have Zarev and team playing in the finals of the U.S. Open. They're going after their first title, and what it shows is Here's this player that that's top five in the world, arguably one of the biggest serves in the world, and you can visibly see the choking on the serve. And listen, I got to top 100 in the world. First, first time I broke the top 100 at the age of 30, and I had one of the bigger serves on the tour, and I still had scar tissue on my serve. I still got tight. Um, I still choked at times. And so I totally know the feeling. And of course, coaching for the last decade plus, I've seen it with my players as well. And so it's our job, Peter, to try to help uh, players understand what is happening, how to possibly change it and, and go to the path of least resistance, because there's a lot of confusion. And as you allude to, I want to talk about and we can talk about together how you can attack it from two different angles, the mental side and possibly the technical side. Yeah. Now, that's interesting that you say that, you know, you, you were former top 100 ATV player. You played in front of 23,000 fans against Michael Chang. You won the first set. Check it out on YouTube, guys. It's really, really cool to see that. And so tell me the difference, the feeling, the progression of going, okay, I'm playing in a little junior tournament and I'm nervous to I'm playing in a national tournament. So I'm playing at Stanford to I'm on the center court of the U S open. Do, do you just get used to kind of that pressure or does it like go way, way up and you're just all of a sudden looking out and going, wow, like I've never felt anything like this. This is crazy. What's interesting for me is the pressure and the nerves comes in waves and it actually varies uh, sometimes from tournament to tournament or week to week. I'll give you an example. Last night, I did a keynote for uh, an organization called YPO, and it was on, on peak performance. And I had to do a little exhibition before with about 80 people. And I could say I was just as nervous playing a little exhibition in front of 80 people in a backyard than I would have been in a big tournament. In fact, there are times I played in the finals of a challenger, let's say, or in an ATP event, and I felt looser than I felt last night. And so I think it can vary depending on the, the situation, how prepared you feel, uh, just where you're at in that moment of your career. So I think it goes in waves. And I remember times where I did feel loose in big, big matches but other times, like you alluded to in that Chang match, I was very nervous before that match because of the situation and because there were millions of eyes on me instead of nobody watching me on the practice court. So it definitely gets magnified if you're self-conscious or if you have uh, some limiting beliefs and you have past history of maybe double faulting or choking. It can be exasperated in these big moments. Yeah, very interesting. That, that's the kind of the thing I think um, that's interesting about tennis is it's a sport to where the nerves are very apparent. A lot of times when you're watching, it gets uncomfortable to watch. I'm sure it's, it's definitely uncomfortable to play in those situations. And tennis is a sport where you're, you don't necessarily even need a lot of people there to get extremely nervous. You know, you can even have a league match to where it's just you and your opponent. I mean, tennis is typically not a sport where there's a lot of people watching yet on an amateur level and on a pro level, um, you can definitely tell, I think you can see the nerves more in tennis 
than a lot of other sports, maybe more than watching a football game or a basketball game. Like it becomes very apparent when somebody is choking. Like what is it about tennis that has that happen? Is it because it's so technical? Is it just because it's just you out there? But like in a boxing match, I mean, you can't really tell if someone's choking in a boxing match. Like why is tennis a sport that we, it's so obvious when we're choking and we don't even need a lot of people to be there. Well, I think you hit it on the head. I mean, you're the only person out there on the court. So all eyes are on you, so to speak. And um, I mean, if you have a trained eye, if you, if you study the game long enough, you can, you can see when someone's choking before they're choking, or you can see when the yips might come, come before another, maybe a player that doesn't have that trained eye. But I think you hit it on the head. It's really that, that concept of, you're the only one out there and you can start to see the ball. You can actually see the ball landing shorter. You can maybe see the ball has a little less pace on it. Of course, you can look at the speed gun on the serve and you can start to see second serves with Zarev 68 all the way up to 80 miles an hour, which, you know, nowadays those serves are, are slower uh, than even, co you know, college high school players are, are hitting. So um, that's, that's the real clue, but I want to counter that a little bit. Um, in that, you know, I've been watching the NBA basketball playoffs and my Denver Nuggets start game one against the Lakers uh, at the time that we're, you know, doing this live stream tonight. And they just beat the Clippers, the team that was supposed to win the world championship. And it's game seven and Murray and Jokic for the Nuggets, just ice water in their veins. I mean, Murray's been meditating for like 30 years. His dad trained him like to be, do these weird things like pushups in the snow and walking uphill. And so he was built for this moment. And then the other side, you look at Paul George, who's literally hitting the side of the backboard. Mm. He, he's one of the top 10 players in the world, and he's hitting the side of the backboard. Now, not many people were saying in that moment, oh, he choked, because you really don't know how nervous someone is. You might just say, oh, they just, they just hit the side of the backboard, or they just double faulted. And so I think a lot of people don't know how nervous people really are, because it doesn't look like that. But then when you get off the court and you actually, if someone's honest, they say, oh my gosh, I was tight as a drum. But you don't usually get a pro to admit that. So I think pros are more nervous than you actually think. They just have such good technique and such good experience and such good wins from their past that I think they can draw on those feelings. Uh, but then when it gets so bad, as you alluded to, that it's noticeable, it of course stands out in tennis more than anything else because it's an individual sport. Yeah, that's great. And congratulations to your Denver Nuggets. And congratulations <laughs> to our tennis fans out there, our totally obsessed tennis players, because now we just crossed the 100, you know, watch mark. We have 104 people on. I, I just want to say hello to Christopher, who's on, and Brad, and Alan, and and um, William Peck, and Ronald. And they're, they're saying that this is a great topic and speakers. Mm -hmm. And so, Jeff, I want to thank you for sure. being on today. And everybody, if you're out there, mm -hmm. you can share the link real quick and get a couple more people on so we can, you know, get our serve going right, get those nerves under control. Let's talk about Zarev specifically. How much, if you could put a percentage on it, how much is him just losing his confidence and, and struggling mentally and how much is it just he's got these technical things that this is just going to happen unless he changes stuff? That's a great question. It's the chicken and the egg syndrome. And as a coach, I always try to look at – now I look at three angles. We talked about earlier, um, you know, before we jumped on, this mindset technique paradigm where you want to look at someone's mindset and see, okay, what, what could I do here to make an impact? You want to look at their technique. Is there something – for technique that you could improve. And then the third is actually the body, what the body can actually do. Because if you're asking a club player to hit a kick serve, for example, and they can't open up their thoracic spine, it's going to be really tough. So I like to look at this triad or this three pronged attack, but today we're spending, we're going to spend some time on the two, the mindset and the technique. And with him, you know, I think, let's say I, then the next question I ask is, okay, what, if I were working with Zarev tomorrow, what would I do? And the first thing I would do, and I'm sure he would, he would pass this test, but we would go out on the court and I would put targets down, very safe second serve targets. And again, you're all thinking, okay, this is just an obvious tip. Every pro does this, but 
you'd be surprised that a lot of pros are not doing some of the real kind of basic fundamentals every day. And what I would do first without changing any technique is I'd put the targets down, super safe targets. And I'd say, okay, Alex, hit, hit your biggest second serve with loads of spin, not the 130 that you actually hit sometimes, which by the way, is better for him to go 130 on big moments. But I'd like to see your 100 or 95 to 100 mile an hour second serve that is just kicking like crazy, and it lands in the middle of the box. I don't, I don't even need it in the corners, just in the middle. And I want to see how many out of 10 you can get. And I might even talk to you while you hit the serve and try to get in your head and say how tight you are, and just see how you do. Now, a lot of pros would say, okay, fine, and they would do it 10 out of 10. Doesn't quite replace what happens in a match. But my guess is that. If I did, I'm guessing, okay, I don't know yet, but let's say I was working with him for 30 days and we did that every day, 15, 20 minutes a day to these big targets and, and, and we just did ad court, deuce court, and we did it for 15, 20 minutes a day for 30 days. I think he would build a lot of confidence in his serve. I'm not convinced that he's actually practicing his serve with that type of detail uh, like other um, pro athletes do like Tom Brady is meticulous about his route running and, uh, the basketball players, Stefan Curry with his dribbling skills. So that's the first place I would look is just simplifying and see if you can hit the targets with your eyes closed for 30 days. Said a lot of interesting things. There are a lot of things I agree with too. I, I like the idea that you'd be working with him and then maybe talking a little bit, getting in his ear, kind of like a little bit of trash talking almost. And it reminded me of from a very early age, Tiger Woods' dad would be there pushing him when he was putting, talking to him. Uh, a lot of people would say, you, know, you have two schools of thought out there. You have, you got to be positive. You got to keep building their confidence. You got to make them feel great about themselves. You know, the, the days of Bobby Knight coaching where you're intimidating and getting angry at them and scaring your student, those are outdated and not effective. You know, what do you, I know, and, and it's, it's, I'm very interested to get your thought on this because you're pretty much what I would consider, you know, a very positive person. You have a Zen-like quality <laughs> about you. I know you believe in all that stuff. Where do you fall on the line of like a coach like Bobby Knight, who like every time you show up to practice, you're scared how much he's going to make you run, that you might get shoot out versus a coach, maybe like I might imagine like a Paul Anacone, who's going to be there with you in your corner and talk you through things and be your counselor. Like, what do you think the right mix is? And is it just depend on the student? And can you, do you change it? Are there some students that they walk through the gate and you're like, oh, I'm going to get in that person today. And is there other people like, you know what? I can't do that to them. I got to be super nice and caring. Like, what do you think about all this? Here's the fundamental difference. When you describe Bobby Knight, he is doing something against the will of a player and he's actually uh, abusing and manipulating. But in my scenario, it would be in alignment with the player. And I would say, listen, this is what we're going to do when we practice. We are going to create more pressure. We're going to simulate pressure that you may feel in the U.S. Open. Can I get your agreement on this? Yes, Coach Jeff, we're going to do this because I'm choking on my second serve and I actually agree with this philosophy. So for me, I always get buy-in with the player. I don't just – and I'm not saying, you know, you suck or, you know, throwing chairs at him. I'm talking about when he tosses the ball, say, you're going to miss it or don't get tight. It's the finals of the U.S. Open or whatever you can do. And listen – that is something you need to get agreement with, with the player. And it's, it's in their best interests and it's not abusive. So that's where I think it's very different. And you just have to try to do your best to simulate pressure and practice. If you know, you have a player that's choking um, with that. And obviously I didn't touch on the technical aspect, but I really wanted to go heavy on the front end around daily practice to big targets to see if you can hit the type of second serve that you want. And I, again, I would, I would argue that, that Alex Zarev is not spending 20 minutes a day simulating pressure to big targets to hit the serve he can. And I had a coach, a fitness coach that, that took a lot of players to the top hundred and he would always do the pop quiz serve drill. And it was simple. Can you hit 10 out of 10 second serves at the end of practice, just like free throws? Can you do it when you're tired? 
And you would see, can I get nine out of 10, 10 out of 10? I don't think the women on the tour are doing this enough. They're averaging, you know, what, uh, every 10 second serves they hit, I think they double two or three times. So they've, they've got to spend more time hitting the targets with intention and with pressure behind them. That is great stuff. And I always say, and I think, you know, we're talking about Alexander Zarev, but remember, everybody on this call today is on for you to get better. And I think it is one of the big mistakes that we do when we go out as recreational players to practice is we have a bad match serving or hitting the ball. We, we go out there like, what happens when I go to practice and I go to play? I don't feel the same. Tomorrow I got to go out and I got to hit cross courts for two hours and get a really good groove, get a doctor feel good practice going. But yet we're not ever putting ourselves under pressure in practice and stacking up the data so you know, like, hey, when I aim at this target, I'm always eight out of 10. You know, almost creating your own propaganda in your head to your advantage. How, how powerful is that in your mind? It's one of the biggest paradigm shifts that we need to make in training tennis and helping players improve is this idea of being able to hit to targets and not focusing on technique. Everyone wants to go to technique. And I tell people, listen, you have two serves. You have the serve that you can make this afternoon if you have to play a match. And then you have the serve that you're going to be developing in six months and 12 months. And, and you have to treat them completely separately in how you approach. And that's very difficult to do because you immediately want to default to technique and try to change your technique before a match. You don't want to do that. So you want to use the serve that you know you can manage and you can win under pressure. And that's where coming into hitting the targets. I talk about hitting through windows above the net. So a lot of people are looking through the net to their targets. Sometimes it helps people to visualize to hit through an area above the net so it takes the net out of play. But doing that, and then I see when people send me serve a video analysis, you've probably seen this, Peter. I never see targets out on the other side. People are just aimlessly working on their serve, their shoulder turn and everything. And they are not, they are not targets. And these are high level I, ATP players, college players. They're not hitting the targets. They're just hitting serves. And then they're also not going through their ritual. They're not bouncing the ball three times and pausing. They're just getting up and hitting serves. They're not switching sides from deuce court to ad court. So there are so many things that we are not doing as players uh, to train the serve as it relates to this approach that we're talking about. And listen, I'm not poo-pooing technique because honestly, when you said what's the percentage, it's probably actually 50-50. If Zara fixes his technique, he probably doesn't have these mental yips. But I'm talking about I got to solve his serve in the next week before he plays in the French Open, and I think I can do it. This is how I would do it. So I would really encourage the listeners to change how they practice their serve and dedicate time to just hitting the targets like you alluded to. That's great stuff. I want to thank everybody out there. We're up to 138 people on to listen to some great stuff today from Jeff Saltenstein. I want to thank you for being on here, taking the time to invest in your game and the knowledge of the game, and you're doing one of the best coaches in the world. And uh, and I want to thank Jeff again for, for being here today. This is, this is great stuff. So – I know also, so we got the drills, let's practice some targets, let's start to measure what we're doing. I also know you're a big believer in like key phrases, things you can say to yourself. What are some things before we even get into technique that Zarev can say to himself, that I can maybe say to myself when I start to choke and that people out there when they start to choke, what can we say to ourselves that actually makes a difference? Yes, I, I like caveman language. I call it caveman language because we're not going to be talking to ourselves in full paragraphs and reading ourselves the riot act when we miss a serve. We're not going to tell ourselves how amazing we are when we hit an ace. We're simply going to give ourselves one word or little phrase commands like higher. So if you're hitting the serve in the net a lot, you're going to say higher or clear the net or hit through the window or toss up. And you're going to really simplify your languaging and you're going to command your mind and your body to do it. And you're going to rehearse that over and over again, because listen, most players have negative thoughts. Most players say my serve stinks today. I can't get my toss in the right place. I have no power. What's wrong with my serve? This type of monkey business seeps into the subconscious mind. It's not woo woo. It is based on science and it really sabotages results. So 
if you can change your self-talk while you're competing out there and encourage yourself, and you don't have to say, oh, my serve is great when it's not. I'm not talking about this Pollyanna approach. I'm talking about objective commands like higher, lower, more spin, flatter, toss it to the left, toss it up, keep your head up. These types of encouragement is you're hoping you're get, you get this from your coach. Like a lot of coaches don't speak like this. They tell you what you're doing wrong. The coaches should be telling you to do this, but you have to be your own coach on the court, especially in the heat of battle to find your way through these challenges. Very good stuff. I want your opinion on this. Uh, Mike T says, uh, my fix would be serving with a radar gun to learn how to accelerate without having to swing at full speed. Now, one thing about the second serve, and you let me know what you think. My personal opinion is when you're swinging a second serve, you're actually still swinging at full speed. You're just adding a different amount of spin to the ball. Now, you as a pro player, did you think the same way or were you swinging faster on a first serve when you were bombing it and then taking some you know, speed off your second serve? What do you think about that? It's an interesting question because, you know, I obviously I've heard that for years. You have to be able to swing just as aggressively on the second serve as the first, if not more. And what I notice is the players that do have the heaviest and the best second serves do that. Now, with that being said, I do still see uh, players. It's almost like they have a variance with their serves. Like they'll accelerate on one and then other ones, they'll be a little more conservative. So maybe one serve is at 102 and another serves at 90. And it looks, when I'm watching on TV, it doesn't look like it's the same level of aggressiveness. So it's almost like they have a smooth swing and they have that real aggressive swing. And so I think as it relates to the question and the and club players out there, uh, us mere mortals that are not playing like Zarev is playing at the top of the game, I think the most important thing as it relates to this is actually understanding the tempo of your swing and when to accelerate not think about maybe swinging like super fast, but actually work on your timing and your tempo and your rhythm. Because most people, I shouldn't say most people, because everyone has different types of serve motions and different things going on. But a lot of people decelerate when they're tight. That's what I did. So if you go up to the ball and at the last moment you slow your swing down, which is what Zarev is doing when he's hitting the 68 mile an hour serve in the middle of the net, you have to figure out how to change that tempo and accelerate at the right moment. And that requires faith and courage and an understanding of how your body works, especially when your body is tightening up in that moment. Interesting. And, and they were also saying that about his forehand. When his forehand, when he'd start missing, they were, they were also saying he's decelerating on his follow through, which is yeah. interesting because a lot of times you're thinking, well, don't swing so fast. Swing slower and it will go in. But especially when you are trying to hit with these players out there, you know, the, the ball is just going to kind of sail on you, right? You know, yeah, you know what would be amazing? This is, this is what I would want to understand, just made me think as you're, you're talking about that, is if they could figure out a way to actually chart the acceleration through the swing when someone's loose and when someone's tight and when it happens, because everybody does say, oh, he just decelled on that serve or that forehand. But I would want to know, like, when in the swing did it actually start to go wonky? And if you understood that, then it, then you could start to be aware of when to accelerate the racket a little bit more. Oh, I gotta I gotta go a little sooner now because I'm tight, or a little I gotta go a little later now. Um, so I think it, if we could get that data, that might even help people understand when to accelerate and when not to accelerate. And I. So the point that I want to make is that it's not necessarily swinging faster or slower. It's knowing when to make the hand go. And the hand can't go. The hand can't accelerate if it's tighter, can't accelerate it much, and if the body is moving more. So if the body moves more, it actually slows the arm down. And guess what are the two things that people do when they get tight? They pull their head. They move too much with their body because they're trying to jerk, and they're too tight with their hand. And that's why with, with my system, the way that I teach, and I know, Peter, you, you teach these principles as well, is that if you can have a loose, if you can teach your hand and your arm to be looser in the moment, and if you can teach your body to be quiet and not jerk your head so much, you actually allow yourself to accelerate on the forehand and the serve more. Mm, very good stuff. I want to give a shout out to 
a, a, a tennis <laughs> instruction celebrity, Maribon. Tennis Miles, yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah he's awesome. Uh, a lot of passion for the game. I believe Smooth, he's also a real student of the game. I mean, Easter gosh, right yeah. And he's a Maribon. lawyer. So, uh, yeah. Maribon, is this your lunch break or are you doing something you shouldn't be doing right now? Right. You might have to make a call Zoom. to your office. Yeah, Zoom. He's, he's probably doing Zoom conference calls, but on the side, he's listening to Peter and and myself. I love it. <laughs> That's good. We do love that. Okay. Um, now, if you we're we're gonna guys, we're gonna see. Maybe we can do this. Maybe we can. I know Jeff wanted to show maybe sharing his screen, so we can try that. Um, if we can, it's no big deal. We'll we'll just do the best we can. But I do want to get into the technical aspects of um, Zareb serve because you you point on some things before we got on and what what happens and if we lost it or whatever that that uh, thing we can just talk about it what would you yeah. rather do you want to try and I'm gonna show try, it or? I'm gonna try to pull it up um, okay. I, I, you know I want I, I want your listeners to understand that there is a method to this madness there is a reason um, there's a reason technically why Zarev may be struggling. And uh, can you see the screen now? It, no, there's nothing there. There would be like a little fainted thing that would come up and it's gone. Okay. So you're going to have to add it to the stream again. Actually, I got it. I got it. We're, we're, okay. we're there it is. It now. Oh, see, that's clutch. Everybody give Jeff yeah. a hand. That's some clutch performing right there. Tech. I mean, I'm not a tech wizard by any means, but, you know, we, we do what we can to make things work for you guys out there. <laughs> okay, so now you can go to the actual screen you want to show us because right now it's kind of like. I see. Um, yeah. That's the part I might have spoke too soon. Um, I don't know. Let's see. Um, no, I don't know how to go get to your rid actual, of that thing. You just go to the actual um, the a actual website or tab you want to bring up or the file. It's literally it's literally just showing what you have on your computer right now. It's it's. It's yeah, I brought, up, I brought up the file. The file is on my screen right now. Huh. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe minimize, uh, you know, don't don't shut the tab, the internet tab, but maybe minimize it and then it might be behind it, might be hiding behind it. Which uh, the internet, oh, does it need to be, no, it's, it's on my screen. It's not, doesn't need to be in a browser. What do I need to minimize? Maybe, maybe your browser, maybe somehow it's like interfering me, with it. Let's yeah. try that. Let me no. um, let me try this again. This right. is fun. This is interesting. I got the Chrome tab. Or okay. Yeah, it that might. Um, yeah, because it's. I think what's happened. Oh, what, oh. I think we might. Have, I think we might have it. You can, might have it. Can you see mm -hmm. my screen? I'm gonna pull it up. Here we go. No. There we go. All right. It's getting better. Oh, good job. Got good it. Good job again. Yes. Oh, man. I, my, my palms were sweating right there. Uh, that is clutch. I'm so proud of you. Okay. So you can see the screen. Um, Zara, you can, correct? Yep. It looks good. Zara, I, I realize Zarif looks like an ant, but, um, you know, I can pull up a video that, that shows a bigger version of him. But I, what I did is I just took a, a video of uh, his match in the Adria tour when he went to play this summer during the lockdown. And this was a game that he, I think he double faulted four times in this game or even 12 times in the match. So for me, this is an example here. He is. I mean, there's a lot of people there, right? It's a sold out uh, packed house, but it's an exhibition. It doesn't count for ranking points and yet he's still choking. So he choked just as much in this exhibition that he did in the finals of the U S open. So it's not like it's just the U.S. Open that created this. This has been going on for some time. The scar tissue in the serve has been building up. And so what I want you to notice, so what I want you to notice is everyone, a lot of people are starting to notice that Zarev's toss is too high. I mean, look at this thing. Mm. I mean, it's like, it's like he's bringing rain with the tennis ball. I mean, I, that is like Sharapova world, maybe even higher than Sharapova's. You guys can see that ball right there. It's insane yeah. how high that toss is. Now, yeah. when I teach the serve, I don't know how you look at it, Peter, but I like the the, the ball toss, or I, I like the ball to drop anywhere from, let's say, 12, 
18 inches to maybe two feet, no, not more than two feet, so that when it drops, you can hit up on the serve and create topspin. But when I see a serve that drops, I mean, that's a good, I know it's hard to see, but that's a good three feet that his serve is dropping. And so it is so difficult when you're, when you get tight to, to time the ball, if it's dropping that much, there's too much going on. So that's where I see people stop. And what I'll do is um, I'll bring up the U S open video as well, but people stop there and say, Oh, his toss is too high, but I'm a big proponent of what do you do with your first move on your serve? How do you get to your trophy position? And what I want you to notice is this ball is three feet out of his hand and his racket, his arm hasn't even moved a lick and it's straight as an arrow and, and a straight arm is going to create tension. It's still, it's still straight. It's still straight. It's still straight. His shoulder hasn't turned yet. It's still straight. About right there as it starts to bend. Mm. That's crazy, Peter. Like that, this is an example of an athlete who is so uber talented. He makes it work for him, but ultimately because that that shoulder turn, it still doesn't happen. Now, now he has a good shoulder turn at the very end. I think it's just too much. It's too much delay. It's too much going on. The toss is too high. How do you sync that up when you have when you're going for a grand slam? It, it's going to take someone who has ice water in his veins, which clearly he's shown that he doesn't, to be able to find that range in that moment. So I think he needs to simplify his serve. Very, very interesting. Um, yeah, that is really, it kind of reminds me of what a lot of coaches talk about to where it's hard to consistently make forehands, especially as the, the game gets faster, when you can see the racket on the other side of the body. You know, it's just, it's just a lot to do in a short amount of time. Do you kind of see a similarity there or what, what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, here's the U.S. Open from last year. And this is when his toss serve was actually, his toss was low, a little lower doesn't drop as much, but it's still dropping a good two and a half feet. But if you, again, if you look, <coughs> this arm is the, for me, this arm is the problem at the beginning of the motion that's throwing things off. I'd love for him. If you looked at John Isner, okay. John Isner has a very compact motion where he gets to his trophy position a lot quicker and mm. not a lot of things can go wrong there. And so this delay, I believe is the culprit in his serve. Now, if I was working with him for 30 days with no tournaments coming up, I 100% believe that he could make this change because he's that gifted. Probably would, mm. it would probably wouldn't take as long as 30 days for a guy like this. But a guy like this is also very successful. And for him to make a change when he already serves 140 is probably a big ask. He has no reason in his mind to change his serve. Whereas if he was 200 in the world and had never broken through, he might come to me to try to fix it. And that's where it gets tricky when you have these great players that have created so much success. They're, they can be stubborn about making wholesale changes, especially if it doesn't work. You know, There's a lot of money to be won and lost and a lot of Grand Slam titles. But me being kind of an out-of-the-box uh, growth mindset coach, if he sat down with me and was open-minded, I would say, I think we need to change your serve technique. We can try the first way with the targets, but I'm just telling you, there are, there are glitches in this. And what's fascinating to me, Peter, is if you look at golf, Tiger Woods has changed his swing three or four times throughout his career. And other players are constantly in golf changing their golf swing in the offseason. Now, I actually think there are servers out there namely Djokovic mm. and Nadal who have visibly visibly and even Federer have visibly changed their their technique on their serve over the years. So it, I actually believe it is some of the elite players that are willing to change that that do it. And so I think in tennis we're a little behind in actually finding the most efficient biomechanics to hold up under pressure and this is an example of it. I bet Alex has just served this way since he was 5 and hasn't given any thought to actually changing his swing, which a golfer would do. Yeah, that's that's great stuff. And I'm glad you brought up Djokovic because I started to think about Djokovic as you were talking about this and making changes. And, and he's the most obvious. I mean, he had this like way, wait, his elbow is in a really weak position. And 
then he had that, I think, elbow injury. So then he had like an abbreviated motion. And then I got to go to the Australian Open this year before the whole lockdown thing. And I was there fourth row watching him serve. And I'm going, that is perfection. Like when you watch it close up, the timing of the toss is perfect. The extension he's getting up. And I don't know if you've seen it lately up close, Jeff, but that serve, he's just not a lot. Some people actually, which is crazy to me, call Djokovic a pusher. And let me tell you, you watch him play close up. That serve, he's popping that thing in there. And yes, he's very consistent. But if you make one mistake, you leave that ball just sitting up a little bit in the midcourt, it's lights out. It's over. So I don't know. What do you think? You think Djokovic is a pusher? You think he's got a weak serve? Or you think that that serves a, a big time underrated right now? He's definitely not a pusher. Um, he's definitely evolved his serve. Again, if you even go back 10 years when he was three in the world and hadn't broken through yet, Todd Martin got a hold of him trying to work on his serve. Another, uh, yeah, someone just said golf mechanics is 40 to 50 years ahead of tennis. I, I would suggest maybe not that much on the other parts of the game. But definitely on the serve, we are still in the dark ages with the knowledge that, you know, we could impart on players uh, to help them with their serve. And obviously, I'm trying to do my part to, to move the needle forward at all levels. But Djokovic has evolved his serve. Todd Martin tried to change it, and then another coach got a hold of him and really helped him with his serve. And honestly, Djokovic is number one in the world because he made those changes in his serve and his forehand. You know, the fear hand, the two biggest shots. It's funny. People want to work on all aspects of their game, forehand, backhand, return, serve. But I would argue that if you charted your match, and this this was, this happened for me, you're going to lose most matches because your serve and your forehand are off. Those are the shots that you hit the most. Those are the shots you have to win with and play big with. You know, uh, when I, those are my two best shots. And when I lost on the tour, yeah, my backhand was my liability on the tour, but it wasn't the shot that lost me the match. Most of the time, eight out of 10 times, it was because my forehand was off and my serve was off. So if you're thinking about how to schedule your practice time, you want to be developing the serve and the forehand, regardless of your level, because if you're not double faulting and you're making a lot of serves and your forehand is rock solid, you can win a lot of matches and kind of hide the backhand. It'll catch up to you at some point, but it's not going to be eight out of 10 matches. If you're serving your forehand or rock solid, getting back to Djokovic, perfect example. The guy has evolved his game as much as anyone on the tour. Nadal, uh, Nadal has done the same thing. And it's no accident that these two guys are at the top level. And listen, some of the young generation guys, I know they're tweaking their technique as well. But when I look at Zarev, He's an example of a guy that I just don't see him making any visible changes. And to be honest, I'm not sure there's people in his corner that actually know how to make the changes. And that's not, that's not to get on them about being inferior coaches or not knowing how to do it. I just think it's a real niche specialty to, to bring in a, a serve doctor or to bring in a golf, uh, a, a swing doctor in golf. Like you may have your mental coach or your developmental coach overseeing the whole thing. This is what I think is also missing from the tour. These coaches and their teams should bring in serve experts, biomechanics experts. And again, it could be a guy that uh, understands the physics of the body and they should sit down with these people and say, how can we make these tweaks in the off season? We got a, a month now. How can we do that? And I don't see people pulling the trigger on that enough. Great stuff. Before we continue, I just want to uh, give recognition to John Craig. He's on with us today. He is an awesome online instructor as well. He's also part of TennisCon 4. We really got a great, amazing lineup this year. I'm super proud of it. And I know, uh, Jeff, you are a big fan of John as well. I am. And, and speaking of the serve, you know, I actually uh, promote one of his courses around being, you know, if you want to build your foundation in 30 days. So I'll give him a plug there. I don't promote too many people because I really want the instruction to be at the highest level. He does a great job with it. And I'm proud to align with, with John and performance plus tennis over here at tennis evolution. And the thought dawned on me, it would be an interesting experiment, but it would, it, it will, it will allow people to step outside the box. Um, 
I'm going to toot my horn a little bit here just to provide an example and some pro provide some context. I think that if let's just take the WTA tour, which typically the women on the tour are struggling more than the men with their serves for various reasons. I think if you did an experiment where you said, okay, we're going to take the top top, we're going to take 20 WTA serves uh, in the top 100 in the world. And we're going to give John Craig 10, 10 of those players and I'll take 10 of them. And we might, John and I might even collaborate on it. I think that if those coaches were not threatened by us taking over their job, because it would be real niche, like they're just the serve guy. Like I'm the coach, you're the serve guy, come in and help us. I think you would see a significant improvement in the level of serving on the tour if you did an experiment like that. And again, it just speaks to, we got to, even at the highest level, we got to figure out how to raise the bar on teaching the serve. I think 80% of the world is serving with a forehand grip. We, we have to completely stop the way we've been teaching the serve the last hundred years and start from scratch and start over with a new paradigm. And that's going to be a tough, tough road to hoe because there's the establishment and there's a way of doing things. But I really think our, our sport would grow if people knew how to hit a topspin serve. And that's why people come to me and they're like, Jeff, I just want to serve like a pro. And they send me serve videos and the video analysis is like, you are so far away and you're still trying to serve the ball over the net. We need to like break this down into small progressions and it's going to take six months or a year and you better be patient with this process because it's not easy. So that's my big soapbox, my big paradigm, my big why that if 10 years from now we saw a, a, a huge change in how people serve at every level and how we taught the serve, I think our game would be better off. I think that's a great step. Talking about the game, because I noticed you commented on one of my posts the other day. Rafa came back after not playing for the longest <laughs> time. Now, I, I granted, Busta was probably tired from the U.S. Open, but still, I mean, and that's another difference. People make excuses for Busta being tired, but Rafa, Roger, Novak, they'll travel all over the world. They've done it for years and years and years. It's not like, oh, they're well, they just had a good week last week, so now they're tired this week. What is going on since you were on the pro tour? Why do we have seemingly champions and then just really talented players? Like ever since I've grown up watching tennis, there's always been someone who comes along and says, mine. You know, at first when I watched it was Borg, McEnroe, Max says, this is mine. Then Lendl said, no, this is mine. Right. Then Becker comes in, mine. Like all these young dudes would always come in. There was no like, well, they're young and you got to give them time to grow into being champions and blah. It's like, it's literally getting super weird that it's almost like Federer is going to have to be 45 and go, okay, guys, I'm tired and I'm just going to leave. And now someone else can win. What is going on? Because even the finals, I'm glad we have a new champion. I'm glad, I'm happy for Dominic Thiem. He deserves it in so many ways, but I didn't see a championship match at the U.S. Open. I didn't see like, oh, man, these guys are so much. This is like the new 2.0 tennis player. Like, what's going on? Where are the champions? Why don't we have any? Yeah. You're, you're going to ask me to get on my soapbox again, Peter. Get on the soapbox, I'm going to jump right back on and, and, and be passionate <laughs> and there tell you is. the There's deal. The so, 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 so you made a post on Facebook. I think I commented on it. I, I, what I, I started noticing a trend about – 10 years ago when the, when the first, the next gen, I think it's Rayonich or whoever's 30 years old, 28 years old. Now they were the next gen, the Dimitrovs and the Rayonich. And, and so here's my theory. And, and you started alluding to it is that every generation we say Borg and McEnroe and Connors, the next generation was better, more explosive. Maybe uh, it was Becker and Edberg. And then Courier comes along. And he's the fit guy who was better than Lendl, who was the fit guy. And then, but then he had a weird backhand. And then Sampras comes along and he has this crazy serve. And then Agassi comes along and he has this amazing return of serve. And so every generation seemed to keep improving. And then Roger comes along and he's this 
Greek god of tennis, and he develops and starts winning slams at 22 or 23. I practiced with Roger three weeks after he won his first Wimbledon in 2004, I think. And gosh, I mean, who knew he was going to end up being the greatest of all time 17 years ago, but there was something special about him. And so this guy has all the shots, all the technique, all the movement. Whereas if you look at past generations, you can find holes. McEnroe, continental grip. Um, Lendl kind of just played, I mean, he had power, but chipped his backhand a lot. Um, uh, Connors, flat, weak serve. Uh, Becker, I don't even know what his weakness were, it was per se, but what I would argue is that the techniques got to a place where they were so locked in and the physicality and the movement got so locked in like this perfect storm of uber talented players blending with the best techniques tennis can offer. And so it's like, how can you improve upon this crazy solid player like Federer and Nadal? And you top that off with Nadal being raised by uncle Tony in this. And this is where I'm going to shift to another comment is that these guys are the last, this is an interesting one, the last generation, Federer and Nadal, that did not have a cell phone or a mobile device in their hands right when they were coming out of the womb. And so to develop the focus and the mental toughness and Uncle Tony being hard on him and teaching him old school values. So now you have the old school, tough, hard values that Nadal developed with this amazing physicality and amazing technique. You can't beat it. You, you created a cyborg and you might not have known it. And now the new gen is a little weaker mentally. They're, a, for whatever reason, a little weaker technically. And they're physically, I mean, yeah, they're in great physical shape, but I still put Nadal up against Zarev and team. I still put Federer up against those guys in terms of just kind of artistry around the court. So I think it's a combination. The techniques have gotten so good, it's hard to beat it. I think the mentality of, kids staring at their cell phones all day. Francis Tiafu is being coached by Wayne Ferreira. He makes him go for runs for 30 minutes without his phone. He makes him do exercise because he's trying to extend his focus because we're in this ADD culture. I'm guilty of it as well. I'm on my phone nonstop and I think it's impacting focus. So I think that's a big thing that you're seeing is that the level is not as good as, as that the big three. They've really Djokovic probably meditates more than anybody. He's gone on this holistic journey with his diet and, I mean, they've, they've really set the bar high, and it's going to be tough for someone to come along to be better than them. When I look at Sissipas, great player, but I still see flaws in his technique with his serve, unlike Federer. I don't see flaws. So it's crazy. Like, what is going to happen when these guys eventually step down? Which, by the way, I think Djokovic has many more years to go, and I think Nadal has years to go. And Federer could play a couple more years as well. So I, the big three is not gone yet. But it's going to be an interesting time to see where the ratings go and to see what the quality of tennis. That first U.S. Open without those guys, I had guys texting me saying this looked like a number four college match between Georgia Tech and Georgia State. Like this was not good tennis. So oh, I, hope, I hope we can find a way to get these guys playing at a higher level. Yeah, I think I think you nailed it with the whole phone thing. And 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 again, I'm not judging. I mean, I cannot. I mean, it's 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 a real. See, I think that's the thing. People uh, kind of like we look at people negatively, like the phone and this and that. It's not like it's the kid, like it's the younger generation's fault. If you go to everybody, go to Netflix and watch something called The Social Dilemma, and it is you can really see how addictive these things are made. To it was be designed. And, yeah, it was designed and, to create addicts of the phone. Yeah, and I am one. I'm just going to admit it. I am one. I'm not. I'm not above that. And uh, and when I think another thing that is, I think these people like Becker and McEnroe and Borg, they kind of had in their head like to be really big, to be really big, and to make big money and to be a big star. I got to win the ultimate prize. Now. For the rest of the sports world and, and just the world in general, I think that's still true because, you know, I mean, 
tennis is not a very popular sport unless you uh, it's 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 depressing sometimes when i go to a, a school and i say who's roger Federer?" and most of the kids still don't know who it is so we're not as big a deal as we think we are but if if you get on social media and th and then all of a sudden you've got a couple million in the bank and you've got like a, a million followers on instagram you feel like you've arrived before you've actually really arrived or at least what arriving used to be what, what do you think about that I think Were they just big, like, I, I, up yeah I think it's a big problem with American tennis. You know, I see these guys that are 30 in the world, 50 in the year world. I see their, I, from America and I see their Instagram uh, posts and everything. And they look like they're like, I don't know, like in the sports car with the chick, like they're not, they're not waking up every day. Like Pete Sampras, just freaking hungry to be the best. They're not waking up like Djokovic. They're not waking up like Nadal with that humble approach. And that our culture is soft, it's just weak. And again, I'm part of it too. I'm not the toughest guy out there. I'm not hard nosed, but I, I just think that, yeah, especially in America, you wonder where the American stars are not hungry enough. That is the biggest problem. When I work with people, it's very rare that I work with a player that's a high level player that has the hunger. And when I do, I'm willing to work with them for free because it's, it's, a, it's so fulfilling but so often now we're babysitting our kids. We, we are, we are making them, um, we're not making them accountable for not giving full effort. They go out on the court and they give a seven or an eight effort. Listen, that's not going to cut it. It's got to be a nine, 10 every time you step on the court. And I think that's one reason I had success. I came from Colorado. I wasn't groomed to be a pro tennis player and I only practiced an hour a day, whereas the kids in Florida's were on the court four hours a day. That hours, hour was like a Jimmy Connors hour. So I had that focus and that drive and that discipline um, to, to allow me to even play pro tennis. So I see it. I, I see the culture now is not as tough. And even there was a video that was sent the other day where Busta, and I'm going to mention about Busta again, you know, he loses one and one to Nadal after, and people say maybe he's tired. I can tell you if Nadal gets on a plane and flies somewhere, he's not losing one and one to anyone. That's how <laughs> good he is as a tennis player. Like, I don't care how tired he is. He's never going to lose one and one to anyone because he's a better tennis player and he's mentally tougher. But they showed a clip of Busta playing Zarev and Zarev, I mean, uh, Busta had a high forehand and he pegged Zarev. And Zarev was almost like, what are you doing hitting me? And I looked at it. And I was like, well, that's the reason he lost. I mean, he didn't lose that match, but that's the reason he lost the U.S. Open because Yvonne Lendl used to just take everybody down with his forehand. And that was just part of the deal. And you just mm -hmm. turned around and you took, your, you took your welt and you just went and you, you got ready for the next point. And he was like whining. And I'm like, dude, that was a legit forehand that he had to hit to win the point. It wasn't like he was being a total jerk about it. He just went where he needed to go to win the point. And that's part of tennis. So I think we need to toughen up the culture a little bit and not do it again in the Bobby Knight way, but maybe it is taking the cell phone away. Maybe it is creating parameters on the practice court where you have to be more disciplined. Um, but yeah, our culture, it's, it's, it's softer than it was. Uh, there's more snowflakes out there. And again, that's not judgment. It's just, it's just not a tough, it's not a tough culture, a tougher culture like it was 30 years ago. Great stuff today. Well, you know what we do? We do have a tough crowd. We've got 166 people came on today Woo! and, and yeah. they're on because they want to get better. And Jeff, I know you got yeah. some training. Um, I don't know if you could tell them a website or you could pop in a link. But I, I know every time I go to YouTube lately, guys, it's pretty cool. If you're looking up tennis instruction on YouTube, you're going to see Jeff. Boom. Yeah, we got some, we got the YouTube, we got the YouTube ads going and uh, obviously we, we make, you know, we make you, you know, we make a, about one YouTube a, a week organically to help people. Obviously I'm, I'm passionate about the whole game as you can tell, but the serve, um, the serve is something that, you know, I, I, people, not everybody knows my story, but I used to have honestly, the worst serve in college tennis. I was barely breaking hundred miles an hour as a freshman. I somehow transformed it. I mean, I know how I did it, but it was a little bit of luck uh, that I did it. And I modeled Goran Ivanisevic. And, and then I went back and I was like this big server in college the next three years. And then I just went on this journey of playing pro tennis only because my serve transformed. And I kept studying the serve 
and I was relentless with my pursuit. And then I've been coaching for gosh, over a decade now on and off the court. And I just meticulously want to understand the serve at the highest level with the mindset and with the technique and how the body works. And so I, I love helping people with a serve and I'll drop a link in here. Um, yep. And basically this link, uh, this is a, ch a chance to get a, a free lesson. Um, the free lesson is um, it's called elbow the enemy. And uh, you may or may not be familiar with it, but it's, it's a good refresher. It's absolutely free. You will, if you, you have to opt in. So you'll be on my subscriber list. If you do it, um, I'm probably going to sell you stuff in the future and I'm going to email you in the future. So just be aware of that. But uh, thought I would just drop this link in if anybody wants access uh, to a lesson that can really give you a, 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 a cool tip, a cool starting point if you're lacking power um, and you want to check it out and you want to develop your serve. So cool. that's Did you the drop link. the link in? Uh, I dropped it in. It looks like it's in private chat. So I oh, need it. Okay. I, need well, to, I'll do that then. I put it in private it. chat. Um, it's funny because I wasn't seeing the comments coming in because I was set up on private chat. So uh, uh, okay. I yeah, apologize. Look, if you click comments, there's tons of comments. Unbelievable. I'm seeing now. So I don't know. I just I put it. If I, I should pick it. In. A, I don't know if I should pick a couple, but um, or if we're just going to wrap this up, I'm cool. But uh, whatever yeah. you want to do. Well, I think I think that this is a great uh, I've actually got to run here, but yep. uh, I thought it was great. And right there, if you see crunch time coaching and you look right under there, there is Jeff's stir fundamentals, tennis evolution, elbow the enemy, opt in, get it today. Jeff, you are awesome. I really appreciate your time coming Thank to you. do this. And and thanks for being part of Tennis Con 4 again, guys. In a couple of weeks, I'll be able to give you guys a link to where you can sign up, get a free ticket for Tennis Con 4. We've got an amazing lineup. I think it's our best lineup ever. And the, the lessons that are coming in are awesome. I had did an interview last night with Dr. Mark Kovacs uh, about how you can create big power. And I actually asked Mark, like, how much do the pros, I know as amateur players, we're concerned about hitting a bigger ball. We want to hit a bigger ball. I'm like, how much do the pros come to you and say, man, I, I need like five, 10 miles an hour more on my server, my forehand. And he's like, there's probably like only 10 guys in the world who don't worry about power. And everybody else is always looking to just find that extra to keep up with the speed that's out there. What do you think about that, Jeff? You played on the tour. How concerned were you at, at about hitting bigger? One of my stories uh, that I like to share is when I was 28 years old, I was playing with a Wilson pro staff and that was my, that was my racket for years. And I remember at eight, I was 28. I hadn't broken the top hundred yet. And there was a player that was 18 years old that was on the rise. And his name was Andy Roddick. And Andy Roddick was playing with a Babolat pure drive. He was the first guy to bring this racket to the marketplace at 18 years old. And I saw how big he was serving. And I was, my, my top end was probably 125, 126. And when I switched to a pure drive, it added five miles an hour to my serve. And I like to think that that helped me break the top hundred in the world. And so uh, power, power matters. But for the club player, I always focus on ball control first. You can't swing out of your shoes. You can't try to swing when you have poor technique. So it's ball control first. I watched Martina Hingis at Saddlebrook for years when she was 16 years old and already number one in the world. All they did was ball control and anticipation drills and footwork drills. The first 45 minutes of every practice develop feel. And uh, I would highly encourage people focus on ball control first and then racket speed. And then after that, and then to build off what you mentioned with tennis con four, like to put a plug in it. Um, you know, you've been doing this now for a couple of years and you always bring on amazing people, Peter, you get the best of the best, the best content out there. So I highly recommend that you sign up and support Peter and support everybody else. If you're a tennis fan and you want to learn and you want to get better. And specifically to my lesson, Peter and I talked about this, the, the creating a bigger kick because I love the serve. I love teaching the kick serve and the top spin serve. And I created a lesson. It's about a 20 minute lesson. And I, I've never revealed things in this lesson that I've revealed anywhere else where I have put it all together in one place, right? So I've done bits and pieces on, online before, but this is a really unique lesson. So if you want to see 
a, a cutting edge breakdown of the kick serve at a very high level from things I've even learned in the last month, last couple of months, because I keep evolving my teaching. You're going to want to sign up and check it out. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. This was great. Guys, Pleasure. thank you for being on. I mean, the, the thing that I love about this crew too is they get on, they stay on. And, and, and we're talking about ADD, right? But when people come on to this, they don't leave. So that goes to show you know, how engaged they are, how much they love tennis. And, and that is very humbling. So I really yeah. appreciate everybody today. One last, I'm seeing some people say how they have pain or they're struggling with injuries or they can barely throw a ball. I'm very serious about this. Please send me an email at uh, support at tennis evolution. My team will pick it up, but I have one of the access to one of the best physical therapists in the world that has done magic for people who are completely debilitated and they've got, they've gone to other therapists and doctors. And I would love to pass that resource on because I hate to see that our, our aging population in tennis is in pain. So please send me an email and I will hook you up with an incredible resource. <laughs> Very cool. Everybody take care out there. I'm going to be doing lives, a lot of lives leading up to tennis con. So make sure you're, you're staying on my email list. You're opening my emails because I, I believe next Friday I'm going to go live with um, Maribon from, from the tennis files. John Craig and I are going to go live. I'm, my goal is to do as many lives leading up to tennis con so I can basically show you guys how amazing our instructors are and give you all more value. So have a great day. Have a great weekend. Go play some tennis and stay safe.